James Watson at left and Francis Crick discovered the structure of the DNA, the oxyribonucleic acid molecule in 1953. DNA are the molecules which make up the alphabet which specifies biological heredity. DNA are the molecules which store the blueprint of life and as such hold a central indispensable position. The RNA polymerase machine complex transcribes the instructional information stored in DNA into messenger RNA. mRNA is built of almost the same four-letter alphabet as DNA. It is more fragile and as such it could also be an information carrier, but less adequate long term. Who wants to find answers about how life started, needs to find compelling explanations about how RNA and DNA first emerged on Earth. In all known living beings, genetic information flows from DNA to RNA to proteins. Their work on the structure of DNA was performed with some access to the X-ray crystallography of Morris Wilkins and Rosalind Franklin at King's College London. Combining all of this work led to the deduction that DNA exists as a double helix. This information was critical for their further progress. They obtained this information as part of a report by Franklin to the Medical Research Council. The report was by no means secret but it put the critical data on the parameters of the helix, base spacing, helical repeat, number of units per turn of the helix and the diameter of the helix in the hands of the two who had contributed none of those data. With this information they could begin to build realistic models. The big problem was where to put the purin and pyrimidine bases. Details of the diffraction pattern indicated two strands and indicated that the relatively massive phosphate ribose backbones must be on the outside, leaving the bases in the center of the double helix. Crick, Watson and Wilkins shared the 1962 Nobel Prize for Physiology and Medicine, Franklin having died of cancer in 1958. Four major classes of organic molecules are found in living cells. All forms of life have organic molecules and macromolecules that fall into these four broad categories, based on their chemical and biological properties – carbohydrates, lipids, proteins and nucleic acids. Nucleotides are essential to cellular metabolism and nucleic acids are the molecules of genetic information storage and expression. General description of the structure of the RNA and the DNA molecule. DNA is the molecule of life which contains the blueprint or instructions to make, for example, proteins that perform most life functions. Nucleotides are building blocks for DNA and RNA. The two classes of nucleic acids are deoxyribonucleic acid DNA, and ribonucleic acid RNA. DNA molecules store genetic information coded in the sequence of their building blocks. DNA can be considered as a modified form of RNA since the ribose sugar in RNA is transformed into deoxyribose in DNA at the five prime positions and the uracil base is methylated into thymidine. The structural difference between these sugars is that ribonucleic acid contains a hydroxyl group, whereas deoxyribonucleic acid contains only a hydrogen atom in the place of this hydroxyl group. Nucleotides which contain deoxyribonucleic acid are known as deoxyribonucleotides. Those containing ribonucleic acids are known as ribonucleotides. Those, thus, the sugar molecule determines whether a nucleotide forms part of DNA or a RNA molecule. These molecules 
consists of three components, a phosphate, a ribose sugar and a nitrogenous ring compound that behaves as a base. The nucleotide is the repeating structural unit of both DNA and RNA. The locations of the attachment sites of the base and phosphate to the sugar molecule are important to the nucleotide's function. How prebiotic events supposedly came up with the right configuration is one of the unsolved riddles. Nitrogenous bases Nucleotide bases appear in two forms. A single ring nitrogenous base called pyrimidine and a double ringed base called purine. High energy precursors to produce purines and pyrimidines would have had to be produced in a sufficiently concentrated form. There is no known prebiotic route to this. Scientists have failed to produce cytosine in spark discharge experiments, nor has cytosine been recovered from meteorites or extraterrestrial sources. The deamination of cytosine and its destruction by other processes, such as photochemical reactions, place severe constraints on prebiotic cytosine synthesis. The origin of guanine bases has proven to be a particular challenge. While the other three bases of RNA could be created by heating a simple precursor compound in the presence of certain naturally occurring catalysts, guanine had not been observed as a product of the same reactions. Adenine synthesis requires unreasonable hydrogen cyanide concentrations. Adenine deaminates at 37 Celsius degrees with a half-life of 80 years. Therefore, adenine would never accumulate in any kind of prebiotic soup. The adenine-uracil interaction is weak and non-specific, and therefore would never be expected to function in any specific recognition scheme under the chaotic conditions of a prebiotic soup. Uracil has also a half-life of only 12 years at 100 degrees Celsius. For nucleobases to accumulate in prebiotic environments, they must be synthesized at rates that exceed their decomposition. Ribose, the pentose 5-carbon sugar ring of RNA and DNA. DNA has the ribose sugar in RNA transformed into deoxyribose in DNA at the two prime positions. A base is attached to the one prime carbon atom and the phosphate group is attached at the five prime positions. Compared with ribose, deoxyribose lacks a single oxygen atom at the two prime positions. The prefix deoxy meaning without the oxygen, refers to this missing atom. The pentose sugar is a 5-carbon monosaccharide. These form two groups, aldopentoses and ketopentoses. The pentose sugars found in nucleotides are aldopentoses. Deoxyribose and ribose are two of these sugars. A DNA strand is formed when the nitrogenous bases are joined by hydrogen bonds and the phosphates of one group are joined to the pentose sugars of the next group with the phosphodiester bond. Ribose is a monosaccharide containing five carbon atoms. Deribose is present as the six different forms. The beta D furanose form is extensively used in biological systems as a component of RNA. The best studied mechanism relevant to the prebiotic synthesis of ribose is the Formose reaction. Several problems have been recognized for the ribose synthesis via the Formose reaction. The Formose reaction is very complex. It depends on the presence of a suitable inorganic catalyst. Ribose 
is merely an intermediate product among a broad suite of compounds including sugars with more or fewer carbons. The reality of the Formose reaction is that it descends into an inextricable mixture. The vast array of sugars produced is overwhelming and the intrinsic lack of selectivity for ribose is its undoing. Ultimately, the Formosa reaction produces a disastrously complex mixture of linear and branched aldo and keto sugars in a racemic form. The consequences of such uncontrolled reactivity is that ribose is formed in less than 1% yield among a plethora of isomers and homologues. The instability of ribose prevents its accumulation and requires it to undergo extremely rapid onward conversion to ribonucleosides before the free sugar is lost to rapid degradation. There are no further alternatives. Either chance choose by a lucky random event, the five-membered ring ribofuranose backbone for DNA and RNA, or it was a choice by intelligence with specific purposes. What makes more sense? This reaction requires a high concentration of formaldehyde, which however readily undergoes a variety of reactions in aqueous solutions. Another problem is that ribose is unstable and rapidly decomposes in water. Furthermore, as Stanley Miller and his colleagues recently reported, ribose and other sugars have surprisingly short half-lives for decomposition at neutral pH, making it very unlikely that sugars were available as prebiotic reagents. Leslie Orgel concludes. Some progress has been made in the search for an efficient and specific prebiotic synthesis of ribose and its phosphates. However, in every scenario, there are still a number of obstacles to the completion of a synthesis that yields significant amounts of sufficiently pure ribose in a form that could readily be incorporated into nucleotides. There have been a wide variety of attempts and proposals to try to solve the riddle, but up to date without success. The article in Science Magazine from 2016 admits, Ribose is the central molecular subunit in RNA, but the prebiotic origin of ribose remains unknown. And a recent research paper from 2018 reports, even if some progress has been made to understand the ribose formation under prebiotic conditions, each suggested route presents obstacles, limiting ribose yield and purity necessary to form nucleotides. A selective pathway has yet to be elucidated. The third component of a nucleotide is a phosphate group. Phosphorus is the third essential element making part of the structures of DNA and RNA. It is perfect to form a stable backbone for the DNA molecule. Phosphates can form two phosphodiester bonds with two sugars at the same time and connect two nucleotides. Phosphorus is difficult to dissolve and that would be a problem both in an aquatic as, as well on a terrestrial environment. Phosphodiesters form the backbone of DNA molecules. A phosphodiester bond occurs when exactly two of the hydroxyl groups in phosphoric acid react with hydroxyl groups of the other molecules to form two ester bonds. Phosphodiester bonds are central to all life on Earth as they make up the backbone of the strands of nucleic acid. In DNA and RNA, the phosphodiester bond is the linkage between the 3' prime carbon atom of one sugar molecule and the 5' prime carbon atom of another, deoxyribose in DNA and ribose in RNA. 
strong covalent bonds form between the phosphate group and two ribose 5 carbon rings over two ester bonds. On prebiotic Earth, however, there would have been no way to activate phosphate somehow in order to promote the energy dispensious reaction. That adds up to the fact that concentrations on Earth are very low. So far, no geochemical process that led to abiotic production of polyphosphates in high yield on the Earth has been discovered. The phosphate is connected to ribose, which is connected to the nitrogenous base. Each of the three parts of nucleotides must be just right in size, form and must fit together. The bonds must have the right forces in order to form the spiral form DNA molecule. And there would have to be enough units concentrated at the same place on prebiotic curve of the four bases in order to be able to form a self-replicating RNA molecule if the RNA world is supposed to be true. A nucleotide is differentiated from a nucleoside by one phosphate group. Accordingly, a nucleotide can also be a nucleoside monophosphate and if more phosphates bond to the nucleotide nucleoside monophosphate, it can become a nucleoside diphosphate if two phosphates bond, or a nucleoside triphosphate if three phosphates bond, such as adenosine triphosphate ATP. Adenosine triphosphate or ATP is the energy currency of the cell a crucial component of respiration and photosynthesis, amongst other processes. The base, sugar and phosphate, need to be joined together correctly, involving two endothermic condensation reactions involved in joining the nucleotides, which means it has to absorb energy from its surroundings. In other words, Compared with polymerization of proteins, nucleotides are even harder to synthesize and easier to destroy. In fact, to date, there are no reports of nucleotides arising from inorganic compounds in primeval soup experiments. Prebiotic RNA and DNA synthesis What must be explained is the origin and prebiotic making of nucleotides that is adenine, guanine, cytosine, uracil and thymine and the transition to enzymatic biosynthesis of these. The emergence in the 80s of the RNA world as a major theory for the origin of life led to increased attention on the prebiotic synthesis of simple RNA and RNA-like molecules. RNA is a complex polymeric structure, but its prebiotic synthesis faces many problems, of which we will give a closer look just to a few. 1. Selecting the right components. 2. Bringing all the parts together and joining them in the right position. 3. The instability, degradation and asphalt problem 4. The energy problem 5. The minimal nucleotide quantity problem 6. The water paradox and 7. The transition problem from prebiotic to biochemical synthesis 1a. Selecting right-handed configurations of RNA and DNA once the three components would have been synthesized prebiotically, they would have had to be separated from the confusing jumble of similar molecules nearby and they would have had to become sufficiently concentrated in order to move to the next steps to join them to form nucleosides and nucleotides. At the chemical level, a deep bias permeates all of biology 
the molecules that make up DNA and other nucleic acids such as RNA have an inherent handedness. These molecules can exist in two mirror image forms, but only the right-handed version is found in living organisms. Handedness serves an essential function in living beings. Many of the chemical reactions that drive our cells only work with molecules of the correct handedness. DNA takes on this form for a variety of reasons, all of which have to do with intermolecular forces. The phosphatribose backbone of DNA is hydrophilic, that is, water-loving, so it orients itself outward towards the solvent, while the relatively hydrophobic bases bury themselves inside. Additionally, the geometry of the deoxyribose phosphate linkage allows for the just the right pitch or distance between strands in the helix, a pitch that nicely accommodates base pairing. Lots of things come together to create the beautiful right-handed double helix structure. Production of a mixture of D and L sugars, that is right and left-handed sugars, produces nucleotides that do not fit together properly, producing a very open, weak structure that cannot survive to replicate, catalyze or synthesize other biological molecules. In DNA, the atoms of the C1 prime, C3 prime and C4 prime of the sugar moiety are chiral, while in RNA the presence of an additional OH group renders also the C2 prime of the ribose chiral. A biological system exclusively uses dexoribose, while abiotic experiments synthesize both right and left-handed ribose in equal amounts. But the prebiological building blocks of life didn't exhibit such an overwhelming bias. Some were left-handed and some right. So how did right-handed RNA emerge from a mix of molecules? Some kind of symmetry breaking process leading to enantioenriched biomonomers would have had to exist, but none is known. Gerald Joyce wrote a science paper which was published in Nature magazine in 1984 where he su suggested that in order for life to emerge something first had to crack the symmetry between left-handed and right-handed molecules, an event biochemists call breaking the mirror. Since then, scientists have largely focused their research for the origin of life's handedness in the prebiotic worlds of physics and chemistry, not biology, but with no success. So what's the cop-out? Pure chance. Luck did the job. And that is the only thinkable explanation. How could that be a satisfying answer in face of the immense odds? But then the same author, Christian de Duve, Nobel Prize winner in physiology or medicine, dismisses instant creation as heuristically sterile. A sterile discovery? In other words, a discovery lacking evidence? In his following book, Genetics of Original Sin, he then extended a bit further and exposed what he meant by heuristically sterile. It is conceivable that the molecules were short enough for all possible sequences, or almost to be realized by way of their genes and submitted to natural selection. So this is the way the Doof thought that intelligent design could be dismissed. This, coming from a Nobel Prize winner in medicine, is nothing short than shocking, to say the least. The Doof dismissed intelligent design and replaced it with natural selection without providing a shred of evidence, but based on pure guesswork and speculation. 1b. 
selecting the right backbone ribose sugar. RNA and DNA use ribose, a five-membered ribose ring structure which is the backbone of the nucleotides. It is found that six-membered rings with six carbons instead of five do not possess the capability of efficient informational Watson-Crick base pairing. Therefore, these systems could not have acted as functional competitors of RNA of a genetic system. Even tough these six carbon alternatives of RNA should have had a comparable chance of being formed under the conditions that formed RNA. The reason for their failure revealed itself in chemical model studies. Six carbon six member drink sugars are found to be too bulky to adapt to the requirements of Watson Crick base pairing within oligonucleotide duplexes. In sharp contrast, an entire family of nucleic acid alternatives in which each member comprises repeating units of one of the four possible five carbon sugars, ribose being one of them, turns out to be highly efficient informational base pairing system. But why and how would natural unguided events on early Earth select what works? Observe the author's end note of a both science paper. Optimization, not maximization, of base pairing strength was a determinant of RNA's selection. But why would unguided events select something that by its own has no function? The five-membered furanose or six-membered pyranose ring would simply lay around and then disintegrate without any function whatsoever. The smuggling in of evolutionary jargon is evident, and so the fact that the authors do omit these relevant questions that should be asked in order to keep the naturalistic paradigm alive. But it's also evident how nonsensical such inferences are. 1c. Size complementarity of the nucleotide bases to form a DNA strand. DNA molecules are asymmetrical. Such property is essential in the process of DNA replication and transcription. Above picture demonstrates why bases need to be paired between pyrimidines and purines. In molecular biology, complementarity describes a relationship between two structures, each following the lock and key principle. The formation of the double helix spiral staircase-like structure, how did it arise? Complementarity is the base principle of DNA replication and transcription, as it is a property shared between two DNA or RNA sequences, such that when they are aligned antiparallel to each other, the nucleotide bases at each position in the sequences will be complementary, much like looking in the mirror and seeing the reverse of things. This complementarity base pairing is essential for cells to copy information from one generation to another. There is no reason why these structures could or would have emerged in this functional complex configuration by random trial and error processes. A both paper from Nature magazine from 2016 demonstrates the complete lack of explanations despite of decades of attempts to solve the riddle. 2. Bringing all the parts together and joining them in the right position. Once all the parts would have been available, they would have had to be brought, concentrated together to the same assembly site and sorted out from non-functional molecules. Joining all three components together involves two difficult reactions. Formation of a glycosidic bond with the right stereochemistry linking the nucleobase and ribose and phosphorylation of the resulting nucleoside. 
In order for a molecule to be a self-replicator, it has to be a homopolymer, of which the backbone must have the same repetitive units. They must be identical. On the prebiotic world, for what reason would the degeneration of a homopolymer be useful? Consider that only random, unguided events could account for the generation, which seems rationally extremely unlikely, if not impossible. The chance for that alone occurring randomly is extremely remote. 2a. Glycosidic bond formation between nucleosides and the base. Whatever the mode of joining base and sugar was, it had to be between the correct nitrogen atom of the base and the correct carbon atom of the sugar. The prebiotic synthesis of simple RNA molecules would therefore require an inventory of ribose and the nucleobases. Assembly of these components into proto-RNA would further require a mechanism to link the ribose and nucleobase together in the proper configuration to form polymers. And then to activate the combined molecule called a nucleoside with a py pyrophosphate or some other functional component that would promote formation of a bond between the nucleoside and the growing polymer. Nucleosides are formed by linking an organic base guanine, adenine, uracil or cytosine to a sugar, here d -ribose. This reaction looks simple, but how it could have occurred by an enzyme-free prebiotic synthesis, in particular involving pyrimidine bases, is an open question. There have been many imaginative ideas and attempts for its solution, all unsuccessful. In most cases, the nucleoside components generated in the experiments attempting to join the bases to the ribose backbone represent only a minor fraction of a full suite of compounds produced, so that synthesis of a nucleoside would require either that the components be further purified or that some mechanism exists to selectively bring the components together out of a complex mixture. How would non-guided random events be able to attach the nucleic bases to the ribos and in a repetitive manner at the same time correct place? The coupling of ribos with the base is the first step to form RNA and even those engrossed in prebiotic research have difficulty envisioning that process, especially for purines and pyrimidines. The emergence and existence of catalytic polymers are fundamental. Postulates of how polymerization could have occurred on prebiotic earth are therefore another essential question that has not been elucidated. There are no known ways of bringing about this thermodynamically uphill reaction in aqueous solution. Purine nucleosides have been made by dry phase synthesis but not even this method has been successful for condensing pyrimidine bases and ribose to give nucleosides. Laboratory-based chemical synthesis of ribonucleotides do most, if not all, require manipulation of sugars and nucleobases with protecting group strategies to overcome the thermodynamic and kinetic pitfalls that prevent their fusion. In a research paper from 2010, John Sutherland reported, under plausible prebiotic conditions, condensation of nucleobases with ribose to give B ribonucleosides is fraught with difficulties. The reaction with purine nucleobases is low yielding and the reaction with the canonical pyrimidine nucleobases does not work at all. Fitting the new synthesis to a plausible geochemical scenario is a remaining challenge.